الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته First, uh, we would like to make some introduction about our guest speaker, inshallah, guest speaker, Brother Villa Phillips. Uh, Brother Villa Phillips was born in Jamaica, but grew up in Canada, where he accepted Islam in 1972. He completed a diploma course in Arabic in Medina and went on to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Usul at the, at the Islamic University of Medina in 1979, and a Master of Arts degree in Islamic Theology from the University of Riyadh in 1985. He has taught Islamic education and Arabic on the junior high and high school levels at Manaret Ariyad schools from 1979 to 1987. Presently, he is enrolled in the Islamic Studies doctoral program at the University of Wales. He has written some books like uh, Blue Are Marriage in Islam, The Qur'an's the miracle, miracle, the fundamentals of Tawheed, and some other important books in Islam. Brothers in Islam, I would like to present to you our guest speaker, Brother Villa Phillips. Thank you. <coughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasuli al Kareem. وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنتي إلى يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on His last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. As you have seen on the programs, the topic of the presentation is what everyone should know about Islam. There are many things that one could talk about which are very important to know about Islam. Among those important things, I have chosen a, an aspect which deals with the legislation of Islam, the philosophy behind it. The basis of it is that Islam came to reform human society. It didn't come to destroy whatever people were doing and replace it with something totally new. You will find when you look at the various principles of Islam that this idea of reformation is fundamental in it. We find a general statement in the Quran wherein Allah speaks of the believers as those who command the good and prohibit evil. What is known in Arabic as Al-Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi Anil Munkar. Now this basic concept, commanding the good implies that not everything people are doing is bad. What they do which is good, Islam confirms, recognizes and encourages. But where they are involved in corruption, then Islam prohibits what is being done. This is a fundamental principle that you will find in Islamic law. As such, when the final message of Islam was revealed in the 
6th century. And I say the final message because this was the message also brought by all of the prophets previ previously. Islam is not looked at as being something which showed up for the first time in history, you know, in the 6th century by the efforts of Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be Allah on him, uh, uh, based on revelation which he had received from God. We do not look at Islam as having begun at that point. Islam began with the first man who was also made the first prophet, and that is Adam. And from Adam's time until that of Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be on both of them, there were a number of prophets who came in between. All of these prophets are considered to be prophets of Islam. The teachings which they brought were teachings of Islam. Because Islam fundamentally means submission to the will of God. And this is the essence of the religion which was brought by all of the prophets. And that religion was one. People in time, due to nationalistic reasons or cultural reasons, etc., gave different names to the religion which was brought by the prophets. But the essence of that religion is one. And it is fundamentally submission to the will of God. And this is what the word Islam means, submission to the will of God. This is why we say that Islam, when we talk about Islam in the final form, is a part and parcel of Islam which was brought by all of the prophets. So, in Islam, in the final form, which appeared in the 6th century, we find that there are certain things which existed amongst the Arabs at the time when the message came, because although the message is a universal message, and this is something made very clear in the Qur'an, it is not the case that we find where, you know, the prophets who came before, like Jesus and Moses, may Allah's peace and blessings be on them, were sent to particular people in particular places for particular periods of time. Their later followers tried to universalize the message. However, the message, when we look even in the existing writings which have been attributed to these prophets, we find that these prophets were sent to particular people. <laughs> However, when we look in the Quran, we find numerous references where God says that Muhammad وسلم, was sent as a mercy to all mankind. He was a universal prophet. But even though he was a universal prophet, the message had to start someplace. He received and he had to be born among some people. So the people whom Allah chose, God chose, to raise among them the last of his prophets was the Arabs of this region, particularly those in the region of Mecca. And when the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, came with the message of Islam, there were among the people certain practices which Islam did not cancel, did not invalidate. And there were some practices which were invalidated. Some people in looking at it, the fact that some of the Arab customs were accepted, look, tend to say that Islam is an Arab religion or they may say it favors the practices of the Arabs, it's a product of Arab uh, culture. However, this is not so. This is not so at all. Those things which we find that Islam has recognized, confirmed of the practices of the Arabs, these things were either practices which were handed down from earlier prophets, as in the case of Hajj. 
Hajj was instituted, Hajj the pilgrimage to Mecca was instituted by Prophet Abraham. The practices were handed down from the time of Prophet Abraham to the time of the Arabs among whom the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was uh, raised. Also, we find that there are some practices which were the result of human intellectual effort which Islam recognized because fundamentally Islam and, the print and its principles do not contradict human intellect they do not contradict reason so those things which people due to their own experiences have concluded are useful Islam will recognize them and as such we find for example certain trade practices their methods that they had in in uh, in barter or in business transactions some of these methods were recognized because if these methods did not exist and they were needed by people then Islam would legislate them because human need is of primary concern in the legislation of laws in Islam. However, I should note that of the principles which were confirmed among the practices of the Arabs, and they were in fact few, the vast majority of their practices were not confirmed. There were only a few, a small portion. But even that small portion which was confirmed practice, what you find when you look at how they appear in Islam now, is that only the basic principle was recognized. However, it, its form was modified. For example, in the case of marriage, they had a number of different ways in which they got married. What Islam did was it recognized one particular form which uh, had in it some concern for the rights of women. It canceled all the other forms which had implied in it, you know, fornication or adultery because they had a number of different forms of, you know, temporary type marriages and, you know, marriages which which didn't have any kind of responsibility with it, you know, where children are not held to be responsible or to be the uh, inheritors of those who are involved in such relationships, etc. These types of marriages were all cancelled and only one particular form was recognized. But even that one form, there were, you know, uh, modifications which were made, significant modifications which were made to it to make it truly conform to the standards of uh, legislation, divine legislation, which would naturally take into account all of human needs. Now, when we look further in the legislation of laws in Islam, we find that there is another fundamental principle there. And that is of removing difficulty. You find in a number of places in the Quran, Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not put a, an obligation or a responsibility on any individual except according to that individual's ability. You find in other places, you know, Allah will speak about that there isn't in the religion any difficulty. Allah has not made in the religion any difficulty. You find the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he was sending some of his companions to govern uh, the area of Yemen, he was sending Ali ibn Abi Talib and Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he told them, Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Make things easy for the people and do not make it difficult. 
So we find this is a fundamental principle in the legislation of Islamic laws that the abilities of people are taken into account. And furthermore, what we find is that there is incorporated in the laws a concession which is given for times of extreme difficulty. In that, if one finds oneself in a situation where one's life or one's limb is threatened, then those things which are prohibited to you are temporarily allowed to you. For example, alcohol, I'm sure you all know, is something which is prohibited in Islam. However, if one finds oneself in a situation where one is starving to death, there is nothing to drink or eat, and death is on you, and all you can find in front of you is a bottle of alcohol. And of course, this shouldn't have been your bottle of alcohol if you're a Muslim, right? I mean, we're talking about a situation where you might have been traveling with some non-Muslims and, uh, you know, your plane crashed or something like this, you're in the desert, and in searching for something you found in the, in the uh, suitcase of the non-Muslim, a bottle of alcohol. I mean, you are not supposed to be carrying it yourself, right? So if you found this situation, you, here you found this bottle of alcohol, you are starving to death. Islam allows you to drink what is necessary to keep yourself alive. Even though the drinking of alcohol is prohibited, you are allowed to drink enough to stay alive. What you drink beyond that now becomes sin. There is a limit. It's not to say it's just open for you now, you're starving, you can do anything, you can drink the whole bottle. No. You only drink enough to stay alive. Anything beyond that now is considered sinful. But this condition is included in all of the Islamic laws where the harm which was in the prohibited practice or the prohibited food or drink is limited to yourself. In these circumstances you are allowed to do it. However, if the harm goes beyond you as in the case, uh, just this last week there was an article in the newspaper wherein a woman was being tried for murder. She was videotaped having tied two young men to a tree. These boys were like 15 or 17 years old. They were tied to a tree. She took a gun and shot them in the head. This was on videotape. Now, she claimed that she killed them to live. This was her defense. I killed them to live. Because the person who was videotaping this had threatened, she claimed, to kill her. She feared that he would kill her if she didn't kill them. So she killed them to live. In Islamic law, this is not acceptable. This is not a defense. Because the forbidden act now is going beyond yourself. You cannot take the lives of others to survive yourself. You know, you're on a raft. There are three or four of you on the raft. You've got no more food. Islam does allow you to eat human meat at that time. Normally, to eat human flesh is forbidden. If one amongst you on the raft dies, then you may eat a part of him to live. Islam allows it. Only under those circumstances. However, it would not be allowed for you to sit as a group and decide, well, so-and-so is the weakest amongst us, so we'll kill him and eat him. No. You can't. Do you understand where the, where the border has to be drawn? 
There's a line that has to be drawn there in the case of dire necessity where you may be allowed to do certain things which are normally prohibited. Furthermore, we find among the principles in Islamic legislation the reduction of obligations. Because if we look at the things which are prohibited in Islam in comparison to the things which are allowed, the things which are allowed are many. The things which are prohibited are few. Very few. And when you look again in the Quran, the final revelation of God to man, we see in it, when Allah is talking about the prohibited things, He will list them by name. Different foods, animals which are killed, you know, uh, by illegal means, which die of themselves, so on, so on, so on. And then after that, Allah will say, and everything else beyond that is allowed to you. You will find when Allah is permitting things, it is permitted in a general sense. Because there is so much. But the prohibited things are specifically listed. So, we find this as a principle within Islamic law, that the prohibited things are few, whereas the permitted things are many. We see also among the principles is that of the realization of human welfare. Within the revelation of Islamic laws, we find that they came, when we look in the time of the Prophet Muhammad they came in a gradual fashion, taking into account the situation of the peoples to whom they were first sent, and uh, when they reached a certain stage where they were able to, to, to grasp and to understand and to practice, then the final laws were given. For example, in the case of uh, alcohol, we find that in the initial, the initial laws, they were just warning the people, telling them about the harm that was there in alcohol. Whereas, in the latter laws, there was complete prohibition. So, the laws came in a gradual fashion. We find in, in the case of Salah, for example, even. Initially, the Salah, the requirement for prayer, was only uh, twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. And then when it became obligatory on a five times a day basis, it was only two units of prayer at each time. However, after the people now became used to it, then it w became, it was increased to four units for those who were residents and left as two units for those who were travelers. So we find this modification, this gradual increase taking place in, and modification taking place in various uh, uh, laws which were instituted to take into account human welfare and human need. For the time which came after the revelation, we find also that Allah and the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, explained the reasons behind the laws, which now enables the people after that time to be able to use the laws appropriately. So this is how human welfare is taken into account. That by understanding the principles behind the laws, the reasons and the causes, then we are able to apply the laws in the circumstances which are most suited. Most, uh, in a word, it is most uh, suitable. So, we have, for example, in the case of the uh, prohibition which the Prophet initially made for the companions, his companions and followers from visiting graveyards, he went on to say later that you may visit the graveyards now. Go and visit them because they remind you of the next life. So it's a principle. In Islam, you're encouraged to go to the graveyard. For what purpose? You're encouraged fundamentally to go there to remind yourself that death is around the corner. That you are going to end up in that situation also. And that you should try to make the best of what time you have in this life to prepare for your death. So 
that encouragement is there. We also find in the, among the basic principles of Islamic law is that of the establishment of universal justice. We find throughout the uh, various rulings in the Quran that Allah calls the people to establish justice even if it is against themselves. Fulfill your commandments, you know, your trusts. These commandments are throughout the Quran. We find an example in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu where a woman from a tribe which was a powerful tribe known as al makhzum this woman stole and she was caught. She was brought before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she admitted that she had stolen. Now the tribe feared that the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, would apply the law which was the amputation of her hand. And they didn't want it applied because they felt it would be a shame on the tribe. So they went to one of the companions of the Prophet who they knew was beloved to him. He really liked him. His name was Usama ibn Zaid. And he was the son of a slave, a former slave, whom the Prophet ﷺ at one point had adopted. Now, they went to Usama and asked him to intercede on their behalf, to talk to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, you know, to try and get him not to apply the law on this woman. So he went and spoke to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. When he did so, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ became very angry. And he asked him, Do you dare to intercede in the fixed punishments that Allah has set? Then he called the people together and he said to them that the people before you, the previous nations were destroyed because when the wealthy, the powerful among them stole, they did not apply the laws to them. But when the weak and the poor among them stole, then they applied the law fully. He say, went on to say after that, if my own daughter Fatima stole, I would not hesitate to cut off her hand. So he emphasized to the people that justice is not something which is for certain segments of the society and not for others. It is universal. And this you find again throughout the principles of Islam. Among those principles, there is a point I should have mentioned in relationship to realization of human welfare. And uh, this one is related to a question which is usually raised in most uh, lectures concerning Islam. And that is concerning plural marriage or what is called polygamy in Islam. As I mentioned before, Islam recognized certain forms of marriage. Right, and this one, the, the form which was recognized included this practice of multiple marriage, wherein a man may have more than one wife. This form was not introduced by Islam, it existed amongst the Arabs, and Islam recognized it, but limited it. I mean, before it was unlimited, a man could marry who many wives he wanted. However, when Islam came, it was limited to the number that Jacob had which was four. Now, some people may argue that a woman is harmed by a man taking another wife. It is something psychologically, emotionally painful to her. So why is it Islam will institute something which will bring about harm to this woman? Now, what we mentioned as the principle of realization of human welfare. This principle recognizes certain facts. That the number of women in society is greater than the number of men. For a variety of different reasons. 
And these women need to have relationships with men because it is a part of their nature. And the only way that the society can remain just and pure is that this relationship be confined to marriage. Now, if one restricts the relationship to monogamy, then it means that there will be a segment of women in the society who cannot get husbands. And they will be forced to, to have to enter into what we call illicit relationships with men, as girlfriends, as mistresses, you know, call girls, as prostitutes, etc., etc. This is what they will be forced into. So Islam, recognizing the need of the society as a whole, human welfare, it then said, in spite of the fact that there is some harm to that individual woman, if we do not allow plural marriage, then the harm to the society as a whole will be greater. So where there is a greater harm and a lesser harm, Islam will prefer to allow the lesser harm to prevent a greater harm. So as Islam confirmed the principle of plural marriage, to prevent the greater harm which would happen to the society in spite of the lesser harm which happens to the individual woman. This basically summarizes the position of Islamic law in terms of human welfare, reformation of society as opposed to destruction and rebuilding, as well as the obligations which exist in Islam. It should also be noted that all of the principles which have been commanded by God, or things which have been prohibited by God, these have all been commanded and prohibited for man's benefit. There is nothing in Islam which we are commanded to do which is not beneficial for us. And there is nothing in Islam which we are prohibited from doing which is not harmful to us. The laws have human society's benefit in mind. God knows what is good for us and what is not good for us. If it were left up to us to determine what is good for us and what is not good for us, then we will set up laws which will favor some people over others. This is something we see in the case of human laws. Every new government that comes in, it cancels some of the laws of the previous government and puts in new laws. Because those who come in may come from one segment of the society or another segment, and they are mostly concerned with the things which are beneficial to their segment. So there is this constant struggle which is taking place of replacement of laws with new laws and so on and so on. Whereas the divinely revealed laws of God these laws are untouchable. We do not change them. These laws are beyond human legislation. It is only for their application. And as I said, they take into account human needs. Some of the laws, none of the laws go against reason, human reason and intellect. They don't go against them. They're not illogical. There may be harm in them, in the things which are prohibited, which we may not grasp. Some things are obvious. Some things have become obvious. Some things will become obvious. But the fundamental principle is that they are for human benefit. This is the fundamental principle behind the legislation of laws in Islam. So, this point, I think, is, is also a very important point for us to keep in mind. You know, when looking at Islam, it's something that we all should know about Islam, you know, so that 
when we are practicing, those of us who have become you know, converts to Islam, we are not practicing Islam on a ritualistic basis. That we are taught you do this, you do this, you don't do this, you don't do this, you do this. No. I mean, you don't just do it like a robot. You know, you program a robot and it just starts doing these things and not doing these things. No. That you strive to understand. Because in understanding, then what you have to do has meaning. And for those of you who are not Muslims, who are interested in Islam and have your doubts or questions, etc., you know, you should never feel shy to ask, why is this or why is this not? Islam encourages questions. As Allah says in the Quran, Is'alu ahl dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. You should ask those who know if you don't know. Islam encourages questions. What you will find in the other systems, other religions, which, in fact, are deviations from the true teachings of Islam, which was brought by all the prophets, that in these systems, there is much which is illogical, and which has to be accepted, as they say, on faith. And as such, you are not allowed to question these things. Whereas, as I said in Islam, the door is open for questioning. And you should question until you are satisfied. With that, you know, I will stop here now, inshallah. And we can look at uh, any questions that you would like to ask. We will look at the questions which have been written, sent up. And uh, if people have any questions which they'd like to just ask directly, they may also put up their hand. So in the course of answering the written questions, if there are any questions which people would like to ask directly without writing them, they may put up their hand and we can, you know, stop or recognize you after answering certain questions. Uh, you want to raise your hand and ask something now? Okay, go ahead, inshallah. You're asking about jihad. Mm. Well, you know, first and foremost, when we're looking at uh, questions, we should first look at the questions which are directly related to the topic, right? Before going off, you know, into uh, international politics, right? I mean, the, the basic topics. And, of course, I mean, we cannot... Uh, deny international politics and, and look at it as something separate from Islam? Of course not. International politics has its place in Islam. There are principles, these same principles which I outlined, these principles are also to be applied when uh, looking at international politics. However, we'll try to begin the questions with those things that are more directly related to what we spoke about, and then inshallah we can, you know, go on to the things which are uh, more distant. Okay? So we'll, I'm not saying we're not answering your question, but we'll tackle it a little later, okay? Inshallah. Uh, we have a question here. Yes, okay. Question, I think Islam is a good religion. Also, Christianity is a good religion. So you have your way and I have mine. How can I be sure that Islam is true? Well, this is the question which... Every human being ultimately has to decide for himself whether he is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. How can I be sure that whatever religion I'm following is in fact the correct religion? Because we see when we look around us, people following no end of religions. Our brother has said that Christianity is good. I can also say that Buddhism is good and Hinduism is good. These are the religions that you find. All of them have in them commandments to good. If you look at the basic principles that are there, they're telling people to do good things. And they're prohibiting people from doing evil things. So it's not just Islam and Christianity, all of the religions. This is why people attach themselves to them. Because they have in them principles which are recognized to be good. So we all have to look at what it is we believe in and what others around us may believe in and 
be sure within ourselves that what we are following is in fact the correct path. How do we know? The way in which we can determine is actually quite simple. If we consider that the purpose of our creation is the worship of God, and this is something which we find in all the religions, there is worship of God involved. The way in which we can determine what in fact is the correct religion and what in fact is the distorted versions because I believe and Islam teaches that ultimately prophets were sent to every nation. Allah says very clearly in the Quran وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا We sent to every nation on earth a messenger of God and يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ الْتَاغُوتِ calling the people to worship God alone and to avoid the worship of false gods. This was a fact. So, what Islam proposes is that that basic message that I mentioned, which was shared by all the prophets, that we should worship God alone and not worship false gods, this is the criterion by which we may determine the true religion and the false religion. In the true religion, only God alone is worshipped. In the false religion, God's creation is worshipped. This is the way we can determine. This is the factor which is shared by all false religion. All false deviant religions worship God through His creation. They believe they're worshipping God, but in fact they're worshipping God's creation. They have rationalized it in a variety of different ways because the human mind is capable of giving all kinds of explanation and rationales for what they're doing. But the fact is that they're worshipping God's creation. Only in Islam will you find that God alone is worshipped and not in any way through His creation. It is totally prohibited to pray to other than God in Islam. Praying to other than God is called shirk and this takes you outside of Islam. If we go to Christianity and you ask why are you as a Christian worshipping Jesus, a man? The Christian will tell you, those who have rationalized it, will tell you I'm not worshipping Jesus the man but God who became Jesus the man. But what is the fact? The fact is you're worshipping Jesus the man. You have rationalized it to say God became Jesus the man but still it is the man that you're worshipping. And this is why even in Christianity you have you know different uh, sects and things which you argue about uh, was Jesus uh, all God or was he part God part man or which part of him was God and which part was man and all oh, this it becomes a big problem for the philosophers of Christianity whereas in Islam it's just God when we go to Hinduism Buddhism and you ask the people you know why are you worshipping this statue the statue which you bought from the, 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 st uh, the corner store they will tell you, listen, those that are more intellectual amongst them, they will tell you, listen, we are not worshipping this statue that you see. We are worshipping God who is ever-present, everywhere, who is present within the statue. That's who we are worshipping, not the statue, not the physical thing. We know we can break it and all these things, we know. We can make another one. But we are not worshipping the statue, it is God who is present within the statue. So here, Rationale has been given to they believe they're worshiping God, but the fact is that they are bowing down and performing acts of worship before a statue. So when you go through all of the other religions, you will find that this same principle exists. 
So if one wants to determine what is the true religion, as I said, it will be the religion wherein only God alone is worshipped. The false religion will be one in which God's creation is worshipped. But in the name of God. They will worship it in the name of God. But it will not be God. This is our basic, simple principle. If applied, we can determine true religion. And this is something which is applicable even to Muslims. Because the process as Islam has spread to various places on the earth, we find that people have, in coming into Islam, brought with them some of their cultural practices. And some of them have been influenced by the peoples around them. And so we find in time that they have incorporated some principles which go against the fundamental principles of Islam. So you may find in different parts of the Muslim world people who are praying to Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. But it is prohibited in Islam. So if a person, for example, you know, accepts Islam in that area, he may be taught to pray to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But this is, this is deviation. This is shirk. This is actually not Islam at all. So it is very essential, even for those people who accept Islam in different parts of the world or who go to other parts of the world where they find Muslims practicing, they have to use this criterion to distinguish between those people who are in fact practicing Islam as it was revealed and those people who are practicing cultural traditions which in fact have nothing to do with Islam.